Now that we've looked at the passage grammatically and literarily, uh, we also approach the passage historically. In other words, uh, in the four-page method, we would ask, what is the trouble in the text? Or uh, in old uh, German scholarship, we would say, what is the sitzum leben? What is the situation in life of this passage? Or to put it still differently, uh, James uh, didn't just come up with the subject in the abstract. He wasn't just pondering what he should talk about and then thought, you know, oh, maybe I'll reflect for a while about faith and works. No, there was a specific situation in the audience to whom he was writing which caused him to say what he did. And so it's very important for us to interpret any passage of Scripture, and this one too, in its historical context. Now when we do that, uh, we right away face this question that was raised under grammar earlier, and that is that if clause in our passage. Verse 15, it doesn't help that the NIV says, suppose a brother or sister. This would sound an if clause as if James may not be addressing a real situation, an actual situation, but a hypothetical one. In other words, there wasn't a real problem that he's addressing. He's just imagining, hypothetically speaking, that this might be the case. And how should we evaluate that claim? Well, first of all, we have Doug Moo, uh, a very good scholar uh, from uh, uh, Wheaton, who uh, follows this hypothetical kind of argument. He says, how realistic is this incident, right? This incident meaning what we're going to meet in verses 15 and 16, the opening part of our passage. And he says, the Greek construction James uses to describe the incident on plus the subjunctive mood suggest, though it does not require, that James is giving a hypothetical example. And the hypothetical nature of the situation is underscored by the indefiniteness of brother or sister. And so the one way to uh, evaluate the Greek text in this case is to say James is not addressing a real or actual situation but an imaginary or hypothetical one. However, I have a bunch of responses to that. This is the point I raised earlier under grammatical. The first response goes like this, and that is this if clause, which is technically speaking a conditional clause, and there are three types of conditional clauses in Greek, a first class condition, a second class condition, and a third class condition. This is clearly a third class condition, but the third class condition doesn't describe a possible scenario or a hypothetical scenario, but actually describes a generic, a general kind of principle. A common situation is in view. And that might be a better way to look at the if clause than in that particular verse. Secondly, when we look at the context, right? Context is king, we often say. And that is, in the if clause, we read not just a brother, but also a sister. And then that present tense of the participle lacking. First of all, the mention of sister. We commented earlier under grammatical that it is unusual for a biblical author to include the feminine right, uh, sister in addition to the masculine brother. And the fact that James adds sister means that he wanted to stress that it wasn't just male believers but also female believers who were lacking clothes and hungry and in need. And that would suggest that, again, he's not imagining, just hypothetically speaking, but he must have a real situation in mind, or else he wouldn't have stressed or added the reference to sister. And then that participle lacking, we comment how it was a present tense participle, highlighting the ongoing continuous nature of the action. And again, that suggests that James isn't describing a isolated case of a brother or sister lacking clothes and food. No, but rather an ongoing, continuous, common experience. I have a quote here from Craig Blomberg, who teaches at Denver Theological Seminary, and also the author with whom he wrote this commentary on James. He says, quote, James could be presenting a hypothetical objection for the sake of his argument. Right? That's the point of Moo that we just read a minute ago. But, now Blomberg is distancing himself from that position, but it seems likely that some in his congregation were making precisely this inquiry. Why else would verses 20, 14 to 26 rebut the viability of a lifeless orthodoxy so strenuously? 
So he's arguing uh, instead for a more real or actual situation. And then a third response to the question of whether James is addressing a real or hypothetical situation is the addition of just two little words that are significant. Two little words in verse 16 are from you. Because if James were describing an abstract situation, he would have just said, if a brother is, and instead he says, a brother or a sister, and then he adds this phrase, if a brother or sister from among you, right? So the phrase from among you situates it, locates the situation within that of the readers. Now, the fourth response is this, even if it were a hypothetical situation. Now, I'm not arguing that it is, but if I would concede for the sake of argument that Moo and others are right, that would nevertheless still be important for understanding the historical context. Because as Watson rightly says, the historical situ the rhetorical situation, the hypothetical situation, is the context in which James wants his readers to understand his words on faith and uh, works. I'll say it differently. If James is the author, and he is, and if he's describing a hypothetical situation, well then he can suppose any situation he wants, right? I mean, he can dream up any hypothetical situation. And so the fact that he dreamed up this specific hypothetical situation, in other words, he specifically portrays a situation where a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking daily food. So, in other words, he wants his comments, James wants his words on faith and works to be heard in this hypothetical situation. And that's therefore important for us to interpret this passage. As Watson puts it, even if the situation is hypothetical, historical information can still be gleaned from the example. Why? Because it was selected, right? The author chose it to address a specific rhetorical situation. So then, uh, let's look at what that specific historical situation is. I've alluded to it a number of times, but now we need to spell it out, nail it down. And that is, James is talking about discrimination. Now, we talk often today about discrimination. We hear a lot today about uh, gender discrimination. We hear about ethnic uh, discrimination. But James isn't talking about that. What he is talking about is social discrimination. Some kind of favoritism showed toward the wealthy or marginalization of the poor. Now, that is supported, that historical context, that trouble in the text situation, is supported in our passage in verses 15. Because James specifically refers to a brother who is poorly clothed and lacking daily food. That sounds like somebody who is poor, somebody who is in need. And it's confirmed by a couple of verses earlier in chapter 2. Remember, this is why it's important for our earlier discussion to see how uh, chapter 2, 14 to 26 is connected to, is intimately linked to the verses chapter 2, 1 to 13. And how that one quote we had earlier said that the historical situation lying behind one passage is also that lying behind the other passage. So all of chapter 2 deals with the same historical context. And what is that problem in chapter 2, verses 2, 3, and 4? Well, the text talks about a person coming into your synagogue in Greek, all right? And I'm using the Greek word synagogue because uh, I want you to think about a synagogue, and, and naturally Jewish Christians, those are the people to whom James is writing, would think of their gathering, would think of their now Christian group gathering, not as an ecclesia, not as a church, but as instead a synagogue, all right? A, a place where one option is, is where people would gather for worship. And if you read those verses, it's quite, from a worship kind of context, we have one scenario that could go like this. So we read about a person with fine clothes and jewelry comes in with a lot of bling bling and everybody there gets all excited and says, oh, welcome. We're so glad that you're here for worship. Oh, are we ever excited? We have a special spot for you right up here in the front. Thanks for coming. But then a person comes in without the fancy clothes, without all the jewelry, without all the bling, and then, well, the enthusiasm and the excitement and the uh, special treatment is uh, not there. They're like, uh, hey, uh, 
Uh, nice to see you. Uh, I think we have a spot for you, you know, in the back if you don't mind. In other words, if it's a worship context, the church is showing favoritism toward the wealthy at the expense of the poor. So that's one way to think of the situation, the historical context. But another possibility has to, has to do with the idea of a judicial context. Why? Well, because a synagogue wasn't just a place where Jews and therefore Jewish Christians went to worship. All right? Jewish Christians, uh, if they thought of their gathering as a parallel, something similar to what happened in their synagogue, knew that people went to a synagogue for all kinds of other reasons. They went there, for instance, for education, for teaching and training. They went to a synagogue for uh, social events and gatherings. And they also went to a synagogue to handle uh, juridical matters. Because good Jews, just like good Christians, don't go to the secular law courts to have their lawsuits or their tensions, their conflicts within the body uh, handled. No, you're supposed to deal with it in-house. And if that's the context, then it might well be, because verse 6 also has this uh, phrase which supports that context, is it not the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Then we ought to envision not a worship context, but a uh, kind of courtroom scene, right, in which there's a tension or some conflict between a rich Christian and a poor Christian. And even though the evidence sides with the poor, the elders, the leadership in the church, are siding with the rich just because of their prestige, because of their status. And this is not a small matter either, right? Because as we know, right, uh, from the summary of the law, right, we're not only to love God with all our heart, our mind, and our strength, but also our neighbor as ourselves. And so this is why Jew, uh, James has a serious situation on his hand. It's not a small problem or a minor problem, but it's a serious problem. And although we don't know whether it's happening in a worship context, although we don't know happen whether it's happening in a juridical context, in both situations, the bottom line is the same. Namely, the church is discriminating against the poor members of their fellowship, right? They're showing favoritism toward the wealthy, and this is violating the summary of the law. They are failing to love their brothers and their sisters as they ought. So that's the context in which we need to hear James discussion on faith and works, right? It isn't an abstract, it isn't James kicking back and just theoretically thinking about faith in general and its connection with works, nor is this James thinking of Paul and trying to contrast what he's writing with the Apostle Paul. No, he's dealing with a specific situation, a serious situation among the Jewish Christian churches under his authority in Jerusalem and Judea, and so he has uh, some strong things to say. That's the context we need to hear him uh, in this particular passage. Well, now that we know that broad historical context, now let's hear his argument more closely. In other words, let's look at first the first two negative examples of what a false faith looks like, of what a non-saving faith involves. And then, like James, we'll switch gears and we'll look at what uh, those two positive examples are like of what a true saving faith looks like. So the first negative example is found in verses 15 and 16. And here we read that if you see a brother or sister poorly clothed, right, uh, lacking daily uh, food, and then what? You say to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed. Now that first command, go in peace, in Hebrew is a very common expression. It's a common expression of farewell, right? Um, a, a contemporary English expression is found in the, in, in the NAB translation. You say, goodbye and good luck. In other words, the important part we need to hear is these Christians are meeting other believers who are in need, and then instead of genuinely ministering to them, what do they do? They utter a cliché, right? Just a fine slogan which really is meaningless and doesn't really impact them at all. Now, before we go on, let me say that that's a danger that we face exactly today. So now I'm kind of shifting from the trouble in the text to the trouble in the world. 
In other words, I meet uh, a believer, right? And I say, hey, how you doing? And then that person catches me off guard and starts telling me that they're not doing well. They start talking about some of the challenges that they're facing in their life. Now inside I'm going, oh shoot, you know, I, I didn't expect this. I, I didn't really want to get into this heavy discussion. I was simply saying hi. But I don't want to appear callous or uncaring and so what am I going to do? And then I go, ah. Oh. Right? I remember these cliches that I save just for these moments. I reach into my pocket and, and I'll say something like this, I'll pray for you. And that'll get me out of the situation. It'll make me sound like I'm caring and empathetic, but, you know, I, I leave that person and then I'm preoccupied with myself and my own world and my own needs. Or, or maybe my first cliche sounds too cliche, so I have a backup one, right? I reach into my pocket and I say to this other person, God will provide for you in your time of need. And I'm somehow blind to the fact that maybe God is pl providing for their for this person in their time of need by me providentially meeting them and asking them without even really knowing what I was asking, how they're doing, and now I have a chance to maybe minister to them and provide for them in their need. And James says, remember, uh, he introduces this question, right, with the uh, negative may, saying that the answer is no. Or remember the ta of fellows, right? What is the prophet that's at the beginning and the end of this first example? And the answer is nothing. Squat. Nada. Or in colloquial terms, James would say that this is a kind of faith that's all talk and no action. All talk and no action. And it's a worthless faith. It's a non-saving faith. The commands, too, are also uh, of note, right? You not only say, uh, you know, go in peace, but you also offer these phrases, be warmed, or warm yourselves, and be fed, or feed yourselves. And as Luke Timothy Johnson points out, this means that the speaker recognizes the need in the other person. In other words, they see what the person is going through, and, and so it's not like they don't know better. It's not like they can't see what ought to happen. Instead, just the opposite. They recognize that this person does need food, this person does need clothes, but yet they don't do anything about it. They just sit and settle for the pious cliché. And James says again that that kind of faith is a dead faith, right? Remember the rhetorical question, expecting the negative answer. Remember what does it profit? Profits nothing. And then the very end of that example has the application, right? In case there was any question about how valuable or whether or not this faith was a genuine faith, a true faith, a saving faith, James at the end says, in the same way, so now he's going to apply this first example and says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. Right? It's a dead faith. It's a worthless faith. No good at all. And so here we see that the contrast in our passage, remember we commented on this earlier, that the contrast isn't one that many preachers and professors and teachers think it is. James isn't contrasting faith and works. Instead, he's contrasting one kind of faith, in this case, a faith that's all talk and no action, a faith without action, a faith without deeds, with a true faith that ought to have action, a true faith that automatically or naturally involves deeds. This is the point where here I quote Doug Moo favorably in comparison to the last quote. It is absolutely vital to understand that the main point of this argument, expressed three times in verses 17, 20, and 26, is not that works must be added to faith, but that genuine faith includes works. That is its very nature. Now, the first example uh, is found in verses uh, 15 and 16 and 17. Actually, there's a problem in verse 18 that I'm skipping over. I don't know if you recognize the problem, but I often say you can't take everything from the study to the pulpit. And here in this uh, online class, you can see you can't even always take everything from the study to the classroom. right? But even though I can't talk about it, it's a good example of I know the problem exists, and therefore if you ask me about it, I could answer you, I'd be informed about it, but I've just chosen for time restrictions not to bring it up or to include it in our main presentation. So we go on to verse 19, and here's where we get the second example, which again is a negative one. And in verse 19, we hear the phrase about uh, 
um, the demons, right? Even the demons believe that God is one, and they shudder. Now, as soon as you hear that phrase, God is one, as soon as J James' Jewish audience would have heard it, they would have right away heard what we refer to in Hebrew as the Shema, Shema Israel, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. This is one of the the professions of faith of Jews, and you can see it elsewhere in Scripture and also outside of Scripture. Now, when you look at that, and maybe I can go with application, what I think James is saying is that even the demons apparently can say the right thing, or if you want to couch it in the words of faith, even the demons have a certain kind of faith, right? A faith that God exists, but somehow that's not enough either because they respond not with obedience, with devotion, but with instead shuddering. The reformers maybe are helpful at this point because they distinguish between three kinds of faith. They talk about notitia, right, a certain kind of intellectual knowledge of something, and they distinguish that from a census namely not just that you intellectually knew, know about something but you actually believe it, you believe it's true and then they still distinguish that from fiducia and that is personally committing yourself to that true thing and so um, a good analogy would be marriage it'd be one thing for you to intellectually know that there is this institution, this social institution called marriage. You kind of understand it, it's been described to you. That, that's one kind of knowledge, notitia. However, uh, that still is different than you believe that it's true. I mean, you actually believe that exists, or you, 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 you assent to it, right? You, you, uh, you recognize that it's a legitimate institution. But that's still another thing from you walking down the aisle with another person and in a sense submitting your very life and your being to this institution, saying, I do. And so in a similar way, it's one thing for the demons or anyone to intellectually understand the idea of God's existence. It's still even another thing to say that that is true, to acknowledge that God is true. In fact, if you stick a microphone in most people's face and say, do you believe in God, a high percentage of people will say yes. They not only understand the idea of God's existence, they even find it very difficult to deny that that's true. But that doesn't mean they reach that third level of faith, namely where they kind of submit to that God, right? That kind of believing in which um, they surrender their very life and their being and it impacts the way that they live. And so, if the first example is an example of all talk and no action, maybe the second example, the demon's faith, is an example of all knowledge and no action. Right? You can know the truths, and even important truths, but that in of itself doesn't demonstrate true faith. And so, knowledge is a good thing, right? We ought to encourage each other, especially with knowledge about God, and as God reveals himself in the scriptures, those are important truths. And we can honor God with our minds, right? Not just with our souls or our spirits. But just because we have a degree from Calvin Theological Seminary, just because we know lots of facts and figures about theology or the Bible, doesn't mean that we are demonstrating true and genuine and saving faith. And so those are the two negative examples of what false faith is, or what a non-saving faith is, or what a faith which is not accompanied by works is like. And now James is going to switch gears, and he's going to give two positive examples of what true faith is, or what a saving faith is like. And both of his examples, understandably, giving his Jewish audience, come from the Old Testament. Now, the first story is one that, for his readers at least, James' readers, would have been a very familiar one. And I'm stressing that because most of us are not like the first readers of James. Most of us are not Jews. In fact, many Christians don't know the Old Testament very well. And that means that, therefore, you'd have to highlight that for them. Because James is assuming that knowledge, right? Even though he doesn't state it, he's assuming that 
Well, he's assuming that before, I mean, this is, this is now what he's assuming. He, he's assuming that you, the audience, knows that before Abram was called Abram, he was just called plain old Abram. And uh, he's assuming that you remember how God kind of called Abram apart and said, Abram, check out the stars in the sky and check out the sand in the sea shore. That's how many your descendants are going to be. In fact, we're going to have to change your name, Abram, to Abraham, right? The father of a people, the father of a nation. And Abraham thinks about it and says, that sounds pretty cool to me, you know, to be a father of a whole people, of a whole nation. And even though he hardly knows this God, he has faith enough to follow this God to a faraway land, a promised land. And he's waiting and waiting and he's waiting and waiting. And after all, he'd settle for just one child, let alone a whole nation. And then he thinks, well, maybe I have to sleep with my wife. Oh, that's, I guess that's not what really is intended by God either. And finally, you know, Abraham is 99. James is assuming you know all of this, right? And God says, it's time. And how does Abraham react? He, he laughs. And Sarah is 89. And God says to her, it's time. And how does she react? Well, she laughs. But it was time. And God does send them a child, a boy. And his name is Isaac, right? Which means laughter. What else could we call him? And so how special is any child, of course, to a parent? How extra special is an only child? And how extra, extra special is an only child to parents of such great age? And what's more, how extra, extra, extra special is this child because so much is riding on him, right? The future of a whole people, a nation, is riding on this little boy, laughter, Isaac. And then, James doesn't say this, he's assuming you know this, he's assuming that, that you know that one day God comes to Isaac, or to, uh, uh, to uh, Abraham and says, Abraham, and I'm choosing my words carefully here because the scriptures say it exactly this way, right? Abraham, take your son your only son, the one whom you love. I mean, do you have to say all that, God, right? I mean, it's almost right turning the knife, right? Because, you know, what a challenging thing it is that God is asking Abraham to do. And frankly, it's impossible for us to kind of understand or comprehend this test of faith that uh, Abraham faces. Some of us who sadly, and I'm including myself, who have sadly lost a child may have a little glimpse or an inkling of the anxiety and the pain that is involved in this testing of the faith, but it really is something impossible for us to comprehend. And James doesn't say this, but he's assuming you know that that you know they're traveling, you know, to 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 Mount Moriah, and uh, you know, little laughter says to his dad, "Hey, dad, we got everything over here except for the sacrifice." You know, hey. And how painful those kind of things must be, too, in this test of faith. But nevertheless, Abraham demonstrates faith because the hand goes up and, well, at this point, James says, did you see it? I mean, there, that's true faith, right? That's the kind of active faith that all believers, all God's covenant people, followers of Jesus, are called upon to have. And remember, he must not be thinking it's just this one act of faith. Remember, it's, um, I think I have that here, that's right, verse 22. You see that his faith and his actions, plural, we talked about earlier, and the imperfect tense to highlight the ongoing nature of how faith and his works throughout Abraham's life were working together. Or to say it differently, a true faith is a working faith, a faith that manifests itself automatically, naturally, constantly with deeds, with works. Now it is true that when James says this, he sounds like he's contradictory to Paul. You see that a person, this is verse 24, is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. But remember, James isn't uh, talking to Paul. <laughs> he's talking to a different specific audience. And what's more, that last word alone is important, right? He says it's faith all by itself. In other words, a faith that's not accompanied by works or deeds.
Well, the first example is longer because James not only highlights the story but spells out the consequence of that story as it relates to understanding faith or true saving faith. So the second example, he can be a lot more brief, right? And he can just simply remind the audience again of a story they know, all the details which will be brought up to their memory just by a brief reference to Rahab and the spies. But it's almost like he says ditto, right? I mean, everything I said about Abraham and his works, working together with his faith, all that would be true also of Rahab. You see how her faith was tested and how her true saving faith was demonstrated, was revealed, was shown in specific acts or deeds. Now, important question to ask, and a lot of commentators don't, and therefore preachers don't either, is why does James put together Abraham with Rahab? I mean, that's kind of an unusual pair, isn't it? I mean, aren't there other heroes of faith? The writer of Hebrews says there clearly were. Couldn't there be other, maybe more noble heroes of faith, no less, that James could have held out for his audience? Why put Abraham and Rahab together? Now, uh, just to, to, well, just, well, I mean, we could say this way. We could say some, some, the few scholars who have asked this question have answered it by saying that the answer lies in hospitality because Rahab showed hospitality to the spies and Abraham showed hospitality to the three visitors. And the strength of this interpret well, first of all, here's a scholar who argues exactly that way. Dwayne Watson, we've heard from him earlier, he says the examples of Abraham, father of the faith, and Rahab, a harlot, are a strange combination, but one found in the tradition because both exemplified hospitality. Now there's a strength to this interpretation, and that is it fits the context. Remember the sitzim laban, or the trouble in the text. And that is, James was addressing the failure of the Christian community to show hospitality to those who were down and out, those who were in need. But there are bigger problems uh, with it that this faces. And the biggest problem by far is that, well, if James had that connection between Abraham and Rahab in mind, namely that of hospitality, he would have cited not the story of offering uh, up Isaac, that's Genesis 22, but he would have told instead the story of Abraham hosting the three visitors, Genesis 18. So if he intended it, he had a great story right there at his disposal, but he didn't choose that. He chose another story instead. And so that really is almost uh, the, the fundamental weakness with this. But the second thing has to do with uh, Rahab not just uh, providing hospitality, but also sending them out by a different way. That's more of a uh, a minor weakness despite my heading here. And then a third minor weakness is that the pairing of these two together is not a common one even in either Jewish tradition or in Christian tradition. It does happen but only late and not common at all. And so if they're not put together because of a common theme of hospitality, is there a better answer for which might explain their pairing? And the answer I think is there, and that is they provide an example of extremes. The technical term in Hebrew literary devices is marismus. marismus. And that's where a writer would use two extremes to describe the whole. So, for instance, um, in the Psalms, you might have in one verse morning and the next verse night. Not because the psalmist has in mind those two different periods of the day, but he's picking the extremes in order to describe the whole day. Or for instance, uh, in poetry again, in one line the, the writer might refer to the heaven and the next line to the earth because they're describing every place. Or another might uh, example would be from the root of a tree to the fruit of the tree, right? From the very beginning to the end. And this is still a modern device that we use today. We, we hear about cars having what? Having a bumper-to-bumper -bumper warranty, right? You pick the two extremes of the car, not because you're highlighting just those bumpers that are under the warranty, but everything in between. And so this is a good literary device where James picks two extremes in order to cover the whole. The extremes are, on the one hand, Abraham. Now, Abraham, that makes sense. 
because he literally is the father of the Jewish people. There are no Jews, or is there is no Israel before uh, before Father Abraham. You, you, you can't get any higher on the totem pole of importance than Father Abraham. But who is Rahab? Well, uh, first of all, she's not even a Jew. She's a Gentile. Secondly, uh, she's a woman. Doesn't sound very politically correct, but in that day that was an issue. In fact, pious Jews, after they first thank God for not making them a Gentile, thank God for not making them a woman. And the third thing was, she wasn't just any old kind of woman, she was the worst kind of woman. She was a prostitute. In fact, you can hardly get any lower on the totem pole of Jewish importance than a Gentile female prostitute unless you perhaps gave her leprosy to boot. And so I see James here picking two extremes, saying it doesn't matter whether you're the great hero of the faith, Father Abraham, or whether you're the Gentile woman prostitute Rahab. The call is the same. Everybody is called upon to have the kind of act of faith, the kind of faith that manifests itself, automatically shows itself in deeds of compassion toward those who are hurting and in need, and in deeds of obedience to God. And I was happy that uh, more re in this more recent commentary to find this same uh, affirmation. So um, Blomberg, whom we've quoted earlier, says, The two exemplars of James' principle of works completing or vindicating one's faith, Abraham and Rahab, contrast with each other in several respects, creating a powerful marismus, a figure of speech which, quote, makes equal the most extreme members of a whole and therefore all the other members who fall in between. If I might move to application, right? I could say it doesn't matter whether you're a seminary professor, it doesn't matter whether you're a pastor, it doesn't matter whether you're a charter member of a congregation, it doesn't matter whether you have a position in society that the world considers high and important and great, or one that people in the world consider to be small and insignificant. The demand for true saving faith is the same for all of us, namely to have the kind of faith that manifests itself in concrete acts of obedience and kindness toward those who are hurting and in need. Well, we've had the two negative examples of what faith isn't. We've had the two positive Old Testament examples of what faith is or what a saving faith is. And then he ends with this simile, right? Just as, so also. So just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. And here you can see how we have two things that can't be or shouldn't be separated from each other. If you separate spirit from body, there's only a corpse, right? Uh, then you end up with a faith that, as James said earlier, is dead. And in a similar way, you can't separate works and faith from each other, right? You can't have that kind of dualism in which you can separate them out from each other. Instead, they belong intimately together. Faith automatically, naturally expresses itself in concrete acts and deeds. So now we go back to the problem we started at the beginning. And this qualifies as yet our fourth principle, theological, because here, this is where we interpret Scripture with Scripture, right? Even though James isn't first and foremost contrasting himself with James, right? There is a point in which we now at least look at the rest of the canon, the rest of the New Testament in our case, and we say now, uh, how does what James says about faith compare to what Paul says against faith? And what then about that question of whether James contradicts Paul. And my answer to that, and that's not a surprising one in light of these presentations, the answer is no. They might seem to contradict each other, but that's only because they're using similar vocabulary to address quite different situations, quite different trouble in the text. So James, and that's the one we've been focusing on, was addressing then a very specific and a very serious problem of discrimination, social discrimination. The church in an embarrassing way was showing favoritism toward the wealthy and marginalizing and neglecting the needs of the poor. And so James therefore stresses works not as 
a way to get saved, not as a way to score points with God, but as a, an essential part of what true faith is. He says that a genuine faith, a legitimate faith, naturally has works and deeds as part of it, especially when a Christian sees another Christian in need. Well, you just don't utter pious cliches. You don't rely on just some intellectual knowledge. No, you act or react. Now, Paul, though, is dealing with a quite different situation. And first of all, you should say it's not in all of his letters. I think that often this justification by faith, uh, you know, ju justification by grace through faith in Christ Jesus is overstated. I mean, it is a big theme in Paul's letters, but it's stressed in only a couple of letters, in Galatians and Romans, where the problem he was addressing, not social discrimination, but a theological problem, right? Uh, James, uh, Paul is dealing with people who want to take especially circumcision or other elements of the Jewish law and elevate it to a theological requirement for salvation. In other words, it's not enough to believe in Jesus. It's believe in Jesus and be circumcised. Believe in Jesus and pay more attention to the holy calendar of Judaism. Believe in Jesus and be a little more persnickety about clean and unclean food. And in that context, Paul can speak negatively about works, not because he's against works, but because he's against those who have elevated works of the law to a level which undermines the redemptive work of Christ. And if you get Paul in a different context, even in letters apparently where he does say negative things about the law, Paul will nevertheless speak positively about the law. So Romans 8 verse 4 is an important verse. Paul says, in order that the righteous requirement of the law may be fully fulfilled in us. So Paul expects Christians to live out the law. Paul has a positive view of obedience and works. And in fact, in Galatians 5, verse 6, and that's important because Galatians has some negative things to say about both the law and works or deeds, Paul nevertheless takes faith and works, although here it's not a noun works, it's a verb, and he puts them intimately together. He talks about faith working itself out through love. So Paul does have the same idea of a working faith, or a faith that naturally manifests itself in deeds. And you have the same thing in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 2, where Paul will take work and faith and put them right together. The work of faith, which I think legitimately can be rendered work produced by faith. right? Deeds that stem from, or automatically emerge from, a true saving faith. So another way to think about the so-called problem of James is James talks about works post-conversion, after somebody is saved, whereas Paul is dealing with works as a way to get saved, right? Pre-conversion works. Here's an analogy from one female scholar that might be helpful for you. She uses a medical metaphor and says that Paul is dealing with obstetrics, right? At the very beginning, right? How new life begins, right? How people become a Christian, how they become a follower of Jesus. Whereas James assumes you already are a Christian. He's not dealing with new birth. He's dealing with pediatrics, little children, and geriatrics, older people, right? People who are already mature in the faith. And how once you've become a Christian, once you've been saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus, you naturally lead lives that are characterized by works or deeds. And it's a bit ironic that uh, Luther, remember Luther who thought that James contradicted Paul on the subject of faith and works. It's interesting and almost ironic that Luther's comments about faith in his uh, preface to his commentary on, on Romans sounds like exactly the kind of thing that James says. So this is now Luther. Oh, about faith. Oh, it is a busy, living, active thing, this faith. It is impossible for it not to be doing goods incessantly. It does not ask whether good works are to be done, but before the question is asked, it has already done this and is constantly doing them. Whoever does not do such works, however, is an unbeliever. He gropes and looks around for faith and good works, but knows neither what faith is nor what good works are. Yet he talks and talks, 
with many words about the faith and good works. Well, we've had a long discussion on the passage, the controversial important passage, James 2:14 to 26. And I do hope that you've uh, learned some interesting and important things about this particular passage. But the bigger goal of our presentation, frankly, is here's another example of how we took our hermeneutic out for a test drive, right? How we've demonstrated how one ought to approach any passage of scripture from a grammatical, literary, historical, and theological perspective. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>